this is actually familiar to uh, uh, all of you, uh, those who have done any experiments, gathered data and try to uh, infer something about relationships between inputs and outputs. So familiar situation of curve fitting to uh, observe data to make explicit the relationship between uh, some parameter of interest which we want to uh, infer as an output with respect to some input parameter or something that is in our control or something that we want to see the dependence. Uh, so, so in any experimental setting whenever we vary some inputs and then measure appropriate outputs and, and try to sort of plot, plot those two things and see the, see the relationship this type of model is, is quite familiar. So we will just try to give it a, a, a mathematical structure and some statistical basis for, for doing this uh, analysis. So in fact the term regression itself we will explain later on but uh, it, it's for historical reasons so actually regress uh, regress in English means to sort of go back, go back to. So why, why that term is used here is, a, is an interesting historical uh, uh, accident or, or not exactly accident, I mean it's a consequence of how this model was first, uh, was first proposed and uh, we will see that uh, in, in the next class which I think will be the last class. So let's get started. So the introduction is that we would like to explore the relationship between variables based on some observed values. So and, and this, this relationship will subsequently be used for prediction or for analysis. So often regression is used uh, in forecasting situations where you want to make some predictions of the future. So in that case, the observed value is what you are trying to forecast and the dependent value or, or the sort of, you can call it the, the independent variable is, is time. So you see how, how certain values behave with respect to time and determine some relationship and as time progresses, in future also you, you sort of extrapolate and then make some prediction or forecast about the value of that dependent variable in future. So regression models are used in forecasting for example uh, or in analyzing the, the quantitative behavior between independent variables and dependent variables. So the simplest situation is that there is a response variable which we will call y and an input variable which we call x. So it's sort of we, uh, we look at a dependent variable y with respect to the values of an independent variable x. So you sort of we plot y versus x which is the sort of natural way of uh, visualizing it. So the, the setting is that we see we are able to observe n paired observations, I mean uh, n paired values. So a pair of values x, y is observed in n instances. So, so here is an example, some group of scientists and engineers are, uh, are trying to uh, improve emission quality in, in vehicles and uh, they are proposing that some additive in gasoline will improve the emission quality. So that is the setting. So here the, the, the task is to explore the relationship between amount of the additive and reduction in the emission. So of course these things will not have an exact relationship because there are so many confounding factors and you know there are other ingredients and uh, there are environmental conditions and, and so on, but the main, main factors 
that we know about the other factors, we will try to keep it fixed during the study and vary the amount of this additive and see what happens to the emission. Okay? So, we are able to conduct a few trials for, for, this, uh, for this study in order to establish whether uh, the introduction of this, this additive into gasoline will improve the emission quality. So, so, how do we plan and conduct such an experiment? We have to try to see that the measurements are made on the same, same vehicle or the same type of vehicle and uh, over a period of time, so that you know, uh, we are able to get some reliable uh, numbers. But obviously, you know, we can't uh, uh, just pick up randomly some observations, we try to control the, the conditions of the experiment. So, we let us say we select several new auto, automobiles, so that at least the wear and tear is the same and uh, they, are, they are as new as possible, so that they are comparable and same brand, so that they have the same performance characteristics and so on. So, we select those as the experimental unit and we measure the extent of nitrogen oxides in the exhaust of the car. So, that is one of the uh, things leading to the pollution. So, we, we measure first without the additive and then with a, with a specified amount X of the additive and we, we do observe some reduction. So, what we are interested in doing is quantifying the extent of reduction vis a vis the extent of the additive in the fuel mix. So, that is what we are trying to quantify. So, let us say we have, we have money and time and resources to conduct say 10 experiments. So, in different settings, so we have managed to conduct these 10 experiments. So, in the bottom you see the, the table. So, for different amounts of the additive, we, we are able to collect some response variable y for values of x. So, what you observe is that there is a certain range of the values of x, in this case 1 to 7 and uh, you would see that some of the values are repeated. So, 1 is repeated, 4 is repeated, 6 is repeated in the, in the input and what you see is that for for the same value of the input, you, you get different you get different output. So, for the amount of additive x equal to 1, you get 2.1 or 2.5. So, this is because the output is not necessarily completely determined by the input, it, it may have some random variation also. Okay? So, the extent of randomness is going to show up in the uh, output values that we see. So, for example, even for the value 4, we see that we get uh, values of y equal to 3.8, 3.2 and if we take further reading, we may get another spread of uh, these values. But broadly speaking, you can see that there is a, uh, there is a sort of increasing trend as the, as the value of x increases, the value of y also increases, broadly speaking. So, for example, the value of x equal to 6 in one of the readings is 3.9 and the value of y for x equal to 5 is 4.3. So, it is not guaranteed that if you increase x, y will increase because there is an inherent randomness in the output. Is that okay? So, we are, we are able to see that there is a broad, broad increase and we want to uh, quantify that that base level phenomenon of increase with respect to the the uh, the input variable but from this data itself we recognize that there is an inherent randomness so in fact one of the high, one of the uh, interesting i mean one of the first questions we ask in regression uh, models when we uh, are able to put down the, uh, uh, the specifics of the model is is there really a dependence so, once, once we recognize that there is some randomness in the, in the output with respect to the input, is there really a dependence? I mean, or is it just that, uh, you know, the whole thing is uh, just some base value 
superimposed with some randomness? Or is there really a, 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 a linear dependence? Okay, so the, the, the scientists in this case would, would, would claim or are hoping to establish that as the amount of additive increases, the, the emissions come down. Okay, so they, they claim that as x increases, y increases. Of course, then, then it is of interest to see how much is the increase, I mean at, at, what, uh, um, I mean, at what ratio does it increase. But first thing is to even establish whether it is an increasing dependence. That means as x increases, y increases. So uh, we will we'll come back to just looking at this data little more closely, but let us just get some, some terminology. So different, uh, different uh, terms have been used over the years. So the, the value x in the, in the previous this thing which is the amount of additive is the control variable or the controlled variable also called the independent variable or the predictor variable and we denote it by x and the effect or the response variable or the dependent variable is denoted y. Okay. So in simplistic terms you know y is a function of x and we are trying to determine what is, a, what is f, what is that function, that is what we are trying to determine. So one, one important thing uh, in this regression study is that there need not be a causal implication. It is not that physically y is a result of x. In, in this example, uh, the, the scientist would, would be claiming that it is because of the additive that it is observed that there, there is actually a causal relationship, that there is a cause and effect uh, relationship, but that need not be so. It need not be so, uh, especially when we are using it for prediction. In, in, in applications where we use regression models for prediction, this need not be so. I mean, I may, I may develop a regression model linking, say, some health indicator with some other health indicator. Okay? So incidence of a certain type of disease with uh, certain other type of disease. Okay, over the years, and uh, I may find that there is a there is a strong relationship between these two, and I may have independent estimates of how one of these incidences is going up, and from that I may want to infer something about how the other is going up. Now it is not it, in this case it is a bit far fetched to to imagine that one of them is causing the other. For example, there could be a common underlying cause, like unhealthy lifestyle or something, which is causing both these things. So, you know, the cause is, it is not that one is causing the other, there could be an underlying variable z which is causing both x and y in a, in a causal, causal way. I may be able to build a relationship between y and x and let us say I have independent ways of, of uh, estimating how x is likely to grow over time and I may want to use that to infer how y is likely to grow over time. So, if I have a relationship between y and x, then using estimates of x, I can get estimates of y. So this is an example where there is no causal relationship between y and x, they are both related to some other underlying cause, but I may still be able to build a regression model and use it, is that okay? So there need not be a causal relationship, but you know often it is satisfactory to, to, to use this model when there is some sort of relationship between y and x. So supposing I claim that there is a relationship between uh, you know, number of deaths because of smoking uh, attributed to smoking in India and uh, you know the number of new homes built in Sydney, Australia every year. Now this could be true, maybe, maybe more homes are build, being built in Sydney, Australia every year and more people are dying because of smoking in, uh, in India every year. Both of these may be growing and I may, uh, decide, I mean, I may discover that there is a wonderful relationship between these two. And uh, because I have estimates of new homes being built in Sydney, Australia, I can infer something about uh, deaths due to smoking in India. But that's a bit far-fetched. I mean, it may be mathematically true. I may find that there's a very nice correlation between the two. But that is not very, very satisfactory to explain and use. But I'm only saying that once we get into the model, there is no implication of a causal relationship. Subsequently, if we want to interpret and use the model, 
it would be nice to have a causal relationship, either a direct causal relationship or an indirect one through a common cause, for example. So, just to emphasize that regression does not mean that there is a cause and effect thing. It often is set up in that manner, but it, it is not necessary for that. So, so what we are studying in a sense is uh, a, a more sophisticated form of curve fitting with careful assumptions and analysis. Is that okay? Yeah. So, returning to this example, you know, the first step in all these data analysis type of exercises is to sort of plot the data and look at it and visualize it. So, this scatter diagram, so you know, what we would, what we would do in an experimental setting is to plot the independent variable x on the x axis and the dependent variable y on the y axis and look at what the plot looks like. So, we see this, uh, this set of values which is plotted here. So, there is a certain range of values of x 1 to 7 and some range of values of y and we, anyone looking at this would, would say that there seems to be an increasing relationship between these two. So, in other words, if we, if we quantify this the form of y equal to m x plus c then that, that m is positive that is what we would sort of infer. But we can clearly see that there is some variability, there is no, there is no one straight line that will fit all these points. So, it is not a, it is not a perfectly explained numerical relationship, but it seems to be growing. And one of the uh, underlying assumptions about uh, linear, uh, linear regression is that the, the dependencies of a particular form which is hypothesized up front. So, for example, here suppose we assume that the relationship is of the form y is equal to alpha plus beta x plus some error term. So, so the, the response variable y i in, in, a, in a given experimental observation is related to the value of x i, the corresponding value of the input variable or the control variable by the linear equation y i is equal to alpha plus beta x i plus some error term e i. For different values of x i, we have observed values of y i. So, x 1 to x n are these set values of the controlled variable which the experimenter has selected for the, for the study and y i are the corresponding output variables which the experimenter has measured. Okay. So, now we may or may not have a full range of values x i, because for example, we may have gathered this data from trials conducted in various places. Subsequently, we may have just picked up that data. In some cases, we may have, we may have been able to design the trial and, and, and commission the study and the measurement. In some cases, we are, we would just be able to collect the data as available. For example, you know, we may want to uh, hypothesize a relationship between uh, some, some economic activity like uh, GDP per capita or something, some, some um, uh, economic output measure per, per person as a function of some health indicator of the population. So, supposing some, some uh, economist makes the claim that the GDP per capita is, is a certain function of the health index of the population measured in some way like say infant mortality or, or any, any health indicator. Okay? So, the number of babies who live beyond a certain age, uh, that if that is good, it means that the general health conditions are good, general economic conditions are good, there is a good government and so therefore, that would indicate that the economic activity is, is in good shape. So, they might want to create a relationship between these two things okay, for whatever purpose, for planning or for, for justifying something. Now, you cannot you cannot play around with the x, x index, right? I cannot, I cannot uh, commission a study in some country where the, where the health index is something. I cannot play around with human lives like that, right? But I may be able to observe. I, I go to various countries and I commission studies and find out that in this place, the health indicator was x i and the economic indicator was y i. I make a note of it. So, I do not have control of the experiment. I just get whatever data I can. And you know, so if I, if I get a range of values of x i, because conditions in the world are, are different, I may not have equally distributed values of x i in the entire range. There may be some clusters 
in some countries because of conditions, some other cluster of values of xi in some other range. So I may I may have say I may have 20 20 readings of xi, 20 observations of xi and corresponding values of yi. The, those 20 values of xi may not be uniformly spread over the range because you know I don't have any control of it really. So although I call it the controlled variable, it is just something that I I, I observe as the input variable and correspondingly I measure the output variable okay which is the response variable so I, I may not have a choice in how how the input variables are are spread over the range and even repeated values are okay in fact it emphasizes the fact that there is an inherent variability in the uh, in the in the output so in, in the example that we saw we, we got some range of values between 1 and 7 and there are repeated values at 1, 4 and 6, that is okay. okay. So now the, uh, I mean one of the key things in, in these regression models is the, the nature of randomness which is uh, sort of inherent in the, in the model. So these, these values ei in this blue equation they are the unknown error components now we don't know what those error components are so in fact uh, if we if we are able to relate what we are uh, doing with uh, this data in this blue equation uh, what is known and what is unknown so in in uh, you know in ordinary mathematics we use x and y to denote variables which are you know to be solved for or to be determined and you know constants like a b c alpha beta and all that as parameters which uh, uh, you know uh, are known but for historical reasons here it's the other way around here actually xi and yi values i equal to 1 to n they are known they are what we observe so we we know xi we know x1 and corresponding y1 so we know the pair x1 y1 and so on up to x xn yn what we don't know are the values alpha beta and the eis we we don't know the, that also okay so there is some some relationship between the xi and yi which is captured by alpha plus beta xi but if yi is equal to alpha plus beta xi then y equal to alpha plus beta x is a perfect linear relationship but we can see from the data that that is unlikely to be the case there is going to be some error term which is ei so that also we don't know so we don't know which part of the observed data is the error part of it and which part is because of alpha and beta because we are not yet we have not yet determined what is this alpha and beta so in this uh, whole exercise the e1 to en are unknown error components which are superimposed on the true linear relationship we don't know what is the true linear relationship but once we hypothesize that true linear true linear relationship there is some error term superimposed on that so these these are unobservable random variables we just assume that with respect to the true linear relationship these are some normally distributed error terms with mean zero and variance some variance okay so it is a leap of faith that we we look at the data and we say this looks like a re linear relationship on which some error terms are are superimposed so we'll see a drawing of this but that's the that's the starting point for the linear regression model the parameters alpha and beta are unknown and if we assume that these error terms are normally distributed with mean zero so why mean zero because mean zero because we the underlying model is neither an overestimate nor an underestimate of the true relationship so otherwise we can always shift the model a little bit if 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 the errors are not distributed with mean 0 we can always shift the model a little bit to get mean 0 but variance sigma square is going to be there some variance is there so the parameters alpha beta and this variance parameter sigma square they are unknown this this determining these unknown parameters in some logical way is the first task in linear regression models okay so this is the this is the way that uh, we can think of uh, visualize the model that for different values xi and xj I mean for different values like say xi xj we observe y so what we assume is that
So, we assume that you know for, for a given x i, y i is something. So, there is under underlying model which is a straight nice straight line dotted straight line, but because of some randomness inherent in the phenomenon y i could take on some value, I mean it will not take on exactly this value, it takes on some value with some distribution. So, it takes on a value let us say normally distributed with mean equal to this and some some distribution. So, it can take on a value higher than this or, or lower than this. So, we plot a sort of normal distribution with some sigma square variance. So, we might let us say we get this value or some, some other time when we take the reading we could get this value like that. Is that okay? So, broadly speaking it is an increasing thing, but superimposed with some variance. So, that is the uh, that is what this curve is trying to uh, show that there is a linear relationship between y and x encapsulated by the equation y is equal to alpha plus beta x. So, uh, alpha is this x intercept I mean y intercept beta is the slope superimposed with some random variables e i. So, the observed value y i is equal to alpha plus beta x i plus e i a random error term. The only thing is we do not know what is alpha, beta and these this error term. So, uh, that is that is the task. So, we we we, we have this uh, normally distributed errors. So, actually there are lots of assumptions this in this model as you can see. Uh, in particular, uh, this assumption of normally distributed errors and uh, the fact that the variance remains the same as you vary x i uh, that is a fairly strong assumption. See normally distributed is ok, I mean uh, because uh, you know it is a it is a uh, what we observe of of y i is some some relationship with x i plus a lot of other things. So, the lot of other things we assume they are many many small small things which add up to the error term and uh, in a given situation some could be leading to increase, some could be leading to decrease otherwise we can always recalibrate and, and get mean 0, but something like the central limit theorem can justify normally distributed errors, okay. but and, and with mean 0 by appropriate calibration. But the fact that sigma square is the same as you vary x i. So, in particular for example, if x i is the time variable, if x i is time, x is time, then the fact that the variance is the same as time progresses that is a fairly strong strong assumption. So, in, in, a, in a branch of uh, applied statistics called econometrics which uh, statisticians and mathematicians and economists sort of get together and use for uh, constructing time series models of data for planning purposes, for uh, for forecasting purposes, for prediction. Uh, this is a big assumption in linear regression models that the variance is the same as x i varies. So, that is I, I believe that is called homoscedasticity. So, that is a heavy duty term to, to indicate that the variance is uh, the same as you vary the, the x value. So, is this is this depiction of the of the data? So, if you if you go back to this, uh, so it is it's something like this. There is an increasing trend in the x y versus x relationship, but there is some error term which perturbs a little bit. So, the 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 god of the process is is generating this or nature is generating this in the following way. Given an x i. The God of the process will will, uh, uh, will will know what is alpha and beta and will compute alpha plus beta x i, then will pick a random number from some table with mean 0 and, and variance uh, sigma square, normal random variable with mean 0 and si variance sigma square, add it to that alpha plus beta x i and then give it to you and that is what you observe. Okay, so, think of it as a game where you give you give the oracle or the, the all knowing uh, generator of the process x i that person with secret knowledge of alpha and beta will, will compute alpha plus beta x i, but just to confuse you will add some random term e i with mean 0 and variance sigma square 
and will give you the answer y i which is the sum of this. So, alpha plus beta x i plus e i. So, what you see is y i. So, you give x i you get back y i that is what you are able to observe and you plot it. Now, you your job is to determine alpha and beta and an estimate of sigma square which explains this process as best as possible. So, finally, you would uh, use this model in a cautious way that if 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 x i is so much then what is y i you would make a prediction and from this data you will see that the prediction is subject to some error because you know even for a, even based on this observation if if x i is equal to 4 then you cannot say exactly what y i is going to be it could be in some range but you are able to give a mean value for that and also give an estimate of the likely error is that okay so that is the task of linear regression to determine this alpha and beta and also estimate this error term sigma square. So, this is the uh, schematic representation of the relationship between y and x. So, in terms of the model alpha is the y intercept beta is the slope both of which have to be determined. So, this you would have used in as a principle in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, your experimental work and curve fitting. The criterion for determining the regression line one of the criterion which is used is uh, this principle of least squares. So, we determine the unknown parameter alpha plus beta so as to minimize the overall discrepancy between the observed values and the predicted values. Okay. So, this is a well known principle which you can easily uh, relate to that uh, So, supposing these are the values that I see, I, I vary x i and compute y i and these are this is what I plot. So, I can I can fit fit a line like this, I can fit another line like this, uh, I can fit various lines. Now, for each of these lines there would be some error with respect to the observations. Some some observations are, are below the line, some are above the line. In fact, some observations will always be above the I mean ha had better be above the line and some below the line. If all the observations are above the line that you draw then the line should be shifted upwards right and if all and, and vice versa. So, ultimately you will find some sort of you will pro probably you will propose a line which is a sort of compromise that some of the values are overestimated, some of the values are underestimated. So, what is the criterion for deciding this line? Well, you want to penalize overestimation and un underestimation and you want to do this in a sort of combined way. So, one of the uh, ways of doing it is to look at the the error term which is y i minus a plus b uh, b x i. So, a and b are estimators of alpha and beta. So, I propose a line a plus b x. So, I propose the line y is equal to a plus b x. So, that is supposed to be an estimate of the line the, the the real line y is equal to alpha plus b beta x. So, a is an estimator for for alpha b is an estimator for beta. Okay. So, supposing my line is y is equal to a plus b x then the observed value y i and the predicted value a plus b x i the difference between the two I want to take as my measure of fit and because I want to penalize both deviations above and below one of the ways is to square it and then and then minimize it, minimize that total deviation. I can do other things, I can take absolute value of the difference, I can do other things, but square is, is one, one thing. So, square one of the things is that you know large deviations from this, this uh, fitted line you want to penalize a little more also. So, you know uh, you, you, you would like to give a little more weightage for large deviations, you want to penalize it heavily. So, you take the square differences. So, square has got the advantage that both, both positive and negative deviations are penalized. Of course, it also says that the penalty grows more and more as you as you deviate. You could also think of taking the cumulative absolute error where you penalize both uh, I mean one thing is clear that just just looking at y i minus a mi minus b x i just some of that that is not a good thing because then positive errors and negative errors will cancel out and you know you you might get a very bad line. So, uh, I, I do want to penalize the errors in both directions one of the ways of doing it is to take the square error. Now, this has got some some logical uh, basis and also it has got 
very nice mathematical properties. In particular, the, the error function is, is differentiable and uh, has got some smoothness properties, uh, which the absolute value error term, sum of absolute values will not have. So, for, for a combination of practical reasons and mathematical reasons, we, this principle of least square error term is, is uh, used, at least as the first uh, cut regression models. So, this, this A and B, they are unknown quantities in this expression and uh, they are chosen to minimize this error term as best as possible and they are then called the least square estimators of a and alpha and beta. So, that is, uh, we, we sort of qualify that they are estimators of alpha and beta obtained from the least squares principle, Re least squares error minimization principle. There, there could be other estimators of alpha and beta. Okay? So, this least square error estimator is, uh, so if you think of this uh, uh, right hand side as a function of a and b. So, remember that y i and x i are known in this, a and b they are just two constants, y i and x i there are n of them, n pairs. So, the summation uh, will, will take all of them into account. So, all the y i's are known, x i's are known, a and b are not known. So, if you treat this right hand side as a function of a and b, I would like to find a and b so as to minimize this function. So, in, in case you have a perfect linear, linear relationship, then all these terms will be 0 then you know I, I find a and b to uh, uh, sort of minimize this, I mean the, the, the lowest possible value of the right hand side is 0 because it is a square of something, so it has to be non-negative. So, in case it is a perfect linear relationship, then I, I may be able to find a and b which is, which would make this right hand side equal to 0, but that is unlikely. So, I would then settle for whatever makes this value minimum. Okay? So, the right hand side is a nice quadratic function of a and b, two variables a and b. So, what is the minimization principle? So, I take partial derivatives with respect to a and b and set them equal to 0, right. So, this this again you would have you would know from from your maths courses or or your uh, other uh, background. Uh, I, I hope everyone would, would, would know this that if I have a function of two variables which are smooth, I mean differentiable, twice continuously differentiable, then the the necessary condition for a minimum is to take the vector of partial derivatives and set it equal to 0 or you know just take each of the partial derivatives and set it equal to 0. In this case you would get two equations, one for each partial derivatives, one for each partial derivative and each of those two equations would be functions of a and b. So, you would actually have two equations in a and b and hopefully you can solve them and get a, get a solution and in this case you can actually solve them and get a unique solution and it will ha it will be it will be a minimum it will not be a maximum or a saddle point or a point of inflection or something it will turn out to be a minimum so these are all nice properties of the least squares principle so is that okay so uh, so just to reinforce the 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 proposed value is alpha plus b, a plus b, b x i and what is observed is y i so the deviation is y i minus a minus b x i so that is to be minimized for for some choice of a and b the cumulative of these deviations is to be minimized. So, uh, this uh, this is called the sum of squared errors, the, the right hand side is the sum of squared errors y i minus a minus b x i whole square and just to repeat that y i and b i, uh, y i and x i are known, a and b are the unknowns. So, they are to be determined. So, uh, the, the sum of square error terms or sum of squares and uh, the optimal values are obtained by setting partial derivatives with respect to a and b equal to 0 and the result is a unique, usually unique. I mean in some very degenerate cases you can get uh, uh, something, but unique and definitely it is a minimum, it is not a saddle point or a maximum and uh, you get those two equations in two variables which are called the normal equations. So, these turn out to be the normal equations. Uh, so that this is a uh, this is a question of simple algebra. You take you take that previous expression for SSE and take the partial derivative with respect to a, set it equal to zero. Take the partial derivative with respect to b, set it equal to zero. You get two equations, and these are the two equations. So this uh, you can just verify by actually doing it yourself. This is simple, and uh, 
those who are interested in the mathematics of these, it, it turns out to be a nice property that you, you, first of all, you, how will you, how will you check whether the solution to these equations is unique, non-unique? So I have two equations and two variables. I think everyone would know how to solve systems of linear equations. So two equations and two variables, this is about the simplest that you can get. So you would look at some rank of that matrix or determinant or whatever test for uh, uniqueness of the resulting solution and you can verify that it will have a well defined numerically stable solution. Okay. How will you ensure that it is a minimum and not a maximum? That is the values of xi which you, a, a, sorry, values of a and b that you get will result in actually minimizing these errors and not maximizing the errors. So one thing is, see there is no question of maximizing the errors because I can, I can just choose a and b to be either very large or very small and this square term will, will, will blow up. So obviously there are, I, I can choose a and b to make this error term as large or as, you know, as large as I want. So there is no maximum, it is a square term, so I can, I can always choose A and B to, in fact I can fix, I can fix A and choose B to make this term as large as I like and similarly I can fix B and choose A to make this term as large as I like. So there is no maximum for this, it is a function which is unbounded, in fact for a fixed B, A can be made very large and this term will be very large. For a fixed B, A can be very small and this term will be very large, right? So for a fixed B, this term is it's a U-shaped function and goes off to infinity in both directions. Is that okay? And similarly for, for fixed A. So in other words, it's, it, from just by looking at it, since it's a square, square term, I, I can imagine that it is going to be a bowl-shaped function of some type. So there is no maximum anyway. It goes off to infinity. So chances are that what we get is, is going to be a minimum. If at all there is any extremum of this function, it is going to be a minimum. But what is the mathematical test for ensuring that it is a minimum? So let me repeat the question that I have a function of two variables. I do something and I find out a set of values and I claim that at this value the, the derivative is 0. So as you know derivative 0 could be for the minimum or for the maximum. So what do I do to ensure that it is the minimum and not the maximum? Second derivatives. So it is a function of two variables, so there are two second derivatives, but there is a little bit of a complication, there are these cross derivatives also, cross second derivatives. So the, the criterion for optimization of, of such functions is to do with the matrix of second derivatives and the determinant of that, I mean uh, some criterion to do with the leading principle minus of that determinant of second derivatives. So that criterion you can apply here and you can see that it, it is actually a minimum and not a maximum and not a saddle point either. Okay. So a little bit of background reading will convince you that this set of equations which you get from the minimization principle which is setting partial derivatives equal to 0 will lead to a solution which is well defined and which is also satisfying the property of minimum from the second derivative criterion. Only in the case of multiple variables, you have to apply the second derivative criterion uh, in to the appropriate matrix of second derivatives, which is that Hessian matrix or second derivative matrix, that, that matrix has to be positive semi-definite, right? You would know this, right? Yes or no? I hope many of you know it, if not, you know, refer to your uh, mathematics textbook and you can easily check that this is true and uh, this, the solution of this set of normal equations will result in a value, set of values A and B which will satisfy this criterion and you will get a minimum and not a, not a maximum. So actually you can actually solve this uh, thing explicitly uh, for uh, uh, simple linear regression of one variable and uh, uh, this is what you get. So actually, so if you define x bar is equal to the mean value of the x's, so if I, I 
I have all these values. So, th there is some mean value of the x's that is x bar and I have some mean values of the y's that is y bar. And uh, with respect to that, uh, I, I can compute b uh, and once, once the slope is known, the, the sort of intercept can be easily found out, the a which is going to be y bar minus b x bar. So, the, 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 the mean values x bar and y bar uh, should, should satisfy you know a plus b x, y bar should be equal to a plus b x bar. So, if I am able to get b, so anyway I have to solve those two equations and uh, it turns out an explicit solution is possible uh, and I get uh, these values as the unique solution for the observed data. So, in this, uh, in these expressions all the x i's are known, they are the input variables, all the y i's are known, they are the output variables, the x bar and y bar are the mean values of the input variables and the output variables respectively and so that gives an explicit exp expression for b and uh, then a is computed. So, I, I can basically I have to solve the equation simultaneously for the two uh, variables. So, for the given data you, you can uh, you can see that uh, given all the x, x values including those repeated values and all that. So, I just compute x bar including those repeated values that is 3.9 and y bar is 3.51 and that those cross terms and all that. So, b comes out to be 0 0.387 and a comes out to be 3.59, uh, uh, 2, 2. So, so the, uh, the regression line is given by y is equal to 2 plus 0.37 x. So, what is the, uh, what is the conclusion for uh, this exercise? So, is the experimenter uh, justified in claiming that increasing additives will, will reduce pollution? Well, the answer seems to be yes, because 0 0.37 is positive. So, if I increase x, y will, y will increase. So, y is actually the reduction in pollution uh, in the emission. So, if I increase x, then I will get some reduction in this thing. So, uh, in, in what range of values is this valid? So, supposing I claim that uh, therefore, uh, if, if, if I give x as 20, then I will get a reduction of 20 uh, whatever, uh, something in x. Uh, that may not really be valid because you know the range of values we have used for calibrating thing, this thing is only from 1 to 7 and uh, you know there is some error in it already. So, if I cannot ex extrapolate it to values like x equal to 20. And you know, although this equation is mathematically valid even for negative values of x, that may not make sense. So, I would be careful of interpreting this, this equation, but it may give me some sort of quantitative assessment of what happens to y as x varies. So, in particular I can use it to interpolate and, and maybe I can use it to uh, uh, get some quantitative assessment which I may like to use. So, actually the thing is that uh, this we will we'll just uh, uh, see given given x i y i is actually a random variable right because of the error term. So, for a for a for a given value of a and b the the for a, for a given value of alpha and beta, y i is a random variable for a given x i because of the error term. So, if I look at uh, the estimators for they are actually in a, in a given in a, in a given experiment, they are actually random variables whose expectation is the, 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 the quantity that we are trying to estimate. So, actually it turns out that a, a and b because of this uh, randomness in the phenomenon, these estimators, they involve the error terms here and, and so they are actually random variables, but their estimates, their expectation actually turns out to be equal to the quantities that we are trying to estimate, which is a good thing because, uh, but, but that has to be shown actually, so that, that can be shown and uh, they turn out to be therefore unbiased estimators of the quantities that we are trying to estimate. Okay. So, now, they will have some variance and 
it turns out that the variance of a is is actually this this term sigma square uh, 1 over n plus this so you can see that the variance of a as an estimator is depends on sigma square which is the inherent variance in the process of course it reduces as n increases it reduces so that is again uh, what you would expect that if i have a lot of data i can get a good estimate of of the line and it it also depends on the the variability of the x var uh, values so similarly the 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 so if the, if the values that i have are are widely scattered then i have a certain variance and also it depend on the inherent variance in the in the process so actually these these estimators that we have constructed from the least squares principle a and b if i view them as outcomes of a random process that means for a given alpha and beta yi is equal to alpha plus beta xi plus ei ei is a random variable then this a and b also are random variables so they will have some variance so they tell me how much confidence i can have in the estimates that i have produced of a and alpha and beta okay so actually the the sum of squares of residuals is actually uh, a random variable and you can you can further show that 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 sum of square of residuals is actually uh, something to do with the inherent variability sigma square so it turns out that uh, sum of square of residuals divided by n minus 2 is an unbiased estimator of sigma square so how much is the inherent variability in the uh, in the uh, in the process that generates yi for for given xi is uh, is given by this so in summary using the least squares principle we can actually get estimates of alpha beta and sigma square so sigma square is the variance of the error term so we can actually get unbiased estimators of alpha beta and sigma square using the data that we have seen so uh, the 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 procedure that we have described which is set up the sum of square of residuals minimize it and set equal to zero gives you normal equations solve those normal equations into two variables then the estimates that you get turn out to be unbiased estimators of of the y, the intercept term alpha the slope term beta and the error term sigma square so that is the procedure for the least squares uh, principle and and getting these so this this a or rather this b and then based on that this a and then this sum of squares of residuals divided by n minus 2 they will in total give you the estimates of the the underlying process okay so uh one thing is that so you can explicitly compute for a given data set a and b and uh, because of the randomness a and b are random variables and it is the expectation and variance of this random variable that we are talking about okay so uh, so any questions so you can uh, just to conclude this part this this lecture see if the data is highly variable look at this case okay so after fitting the best fit line whatever we we have it is not exact but you know it's pretty good so there will be a a, a confidence level for for the b which is the slope okay whereas if i if i do the same thing in fact it may be the very same line but this this line has got qualitatively different behavior from the other line in terms of my confidence of the prediction right so how is that captured if we believe that the underlying process is alpha plus beta xi plus plus an error term then the, for a given xi the outcome yi is a random variable okay and so therefore the 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 expression for a and b which i have which we've derived using that least squares principle that will be a random variable okay for a given set of experiments where xi are chosen and yi is observed if we believe that it is an outcome of alpha plus beta xi plus an error term then the outcome is a random variable so each yi is a random variable given xi okay so the estimates a and b which we have got formulas for they are 
random variables. And in fact, they will turn out to be sums of some error term. So in fact, you can show that they are normally distributed random variables, but they are random variables. So they will have some expectation, they will have some variance. Okay? It turns out that the way we have constructed it, the expectation of A is actually equal to alpha, which is the quantity we are trying to estimate, and the expectation of B is, is actually beta that we are trying to estimate, which is, which is how it should be. And then the variances are also there. So we can actually use it to construct confidence intervals for, for alpha and beta. Okay? And of course, for prediction also, we can get some confidence intervals. So let's see how far we can go in the next, uh, next class. But if you have any questions now, please ask. Variance and E. Yeah, so the, 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 see, EI is assumed to be a, a normally distributed random variable with variance sigma square. And the sum of square of residual errors divided by n minus 2, where n is the number of readings, is an unbiased estimate of the sigma square. So that means that EI term. So here, the sum of square of residual errors is this summation of the, it's, it's actually the objective function, I mean that function that we had constructed. So that thing divided by n minus 2 is actually an unbiased estimator of sigma square. I mean roughly speaking, you know, it's the same principle, why n minus 2? So of course this is a sum of errors, right? So you can't just take the sum of errors and, and take that as the estimate of the error. You have to divide it by something because it is the sum of so many terms. So it, you have to divide it by something. But you know we are using we are using the same data to estimate x bar and we are using the same data to estimate. We are using the same data to estimate these two parameters. So it, you have to divide by n minus 2 and not n. So that turns out to be the explanation for that. But something like this is going to be the estimator for the inherent error in the process that is sigma square. 